right, welcome as people are coming in. Welcome, join us. Um, as you're coming into the room, I will repeat all of this, so don't worry if you're missing some of it, um, but you'll see that we have the chat open, we have the Q&A box open, so feel free to chat amongst yourselves. Um, please make sure to set your chat setting to all panelists and attendees, or else you'll be talking only to the people who are on screen who may be busy speaking to each other. Um, so once again, feel free to chime in with where you're coming from. It seems like we have people across like four time zones on screen. So I think that bodes well for those of you who are in the audience. And thank you to all of you who were so good about sharing this event on social media um, and signing up super fast. We only put it online like a week ago and here are all of you showing up. So that's awesome. Um, once again, feel free to chat with the chat box. And if you already have questions for the authors, we do have the Q&A box open at the bottom. And you can use that to deposit any questions that you might have for the end of the event. We're gonna get going in just a minute, but until then, I'm going to keep sharing this same information and some of you will memorize it and that will be nice for you, I'm sure. Um, so yes, welcome in. It's good to see everybody tonight. Feel free to chime in, letting us know where you're coming in from. Brian from Boston is here. Alex also from Boston is here. Um, yes. All right. I think Chattanooga, Suriname, Valerie from Atlanta. Yes, this is great. British Columbia, Israel, New York, Binghamton. Excellent. So as we thought, people from everywhere, that's so exciting. I think it's one of the best things about virtual events is getting to see people from all over the place. So welcome everybody to the event and we will get going. As I said, welcome to tonight's virtual event with a fantastic sci-fi fantasy author panel with Brookline Booksmith, that's us, featuring C.L. Polk, Malka Older, and Catherine Addison in conversation with Alex Brown. My name is also Alex, and I'm the events director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, we're really excited to have you here returning to our um, family tonight. And if this is the first time you're even hearing of us, well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your support of the authors. Thank you for the support of an independent bookstore. We're really excited to have every single person who's viewing this as part of our community. The chat and question boxes are both open, so feel free to make use of those. Remember, if you would like to chat, to set your chat to all panelists and attendees so that you can talk to each other. And please drop any and all questions for the authors into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window so that they're not lost in the chat. There will be an audience Q&A, so get those questions ready and you can put them there as soon as they arise in your mind. Please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language, and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for partaking in such behavior. Now, I'm personally excited to be the host for tonight's event because we have three awesome authors of speculative fiction and one incredible moderator all on the stage. Um, C.L. Polk is the best-selling world fantasy award-winning author of the critically acclaimed novels The Midnight Bargain and Witchmark, which was also nominated for the Nebula, Locus, Aurora, and Lambda Literary Awards. The last volume of the Kingston Cycle series, Soul Star, just came out, and we are so, so, so excited to celebrate that with them today. Um, all of these are incredible authors, but this event really arose because of the release of Soul Star. Um, so that's just wonderful. Congratulations, Chelsea. It's great. Um, Malka Older is a writer, aid working, worker, and sociologist. Her science fiction political thriller series, The Sentinel Cycle Trilogy, was a finalist for the Hugo Best Series Award of 2018. And if you have not read those books, once you read them, you will not forget them. They will keep their claws sort of in your brain for years afterwards. So. Um, I highly recommend getting to that and just having like this new additional permanent thing um, that's part of storytelling in your head. Um, Catherine Addison is a novelist and short story author. Her novel, The Goblin Emperor, received the Locus Award for Best Fantasy Novel and was nom nominated for the Nebula, Hugo, and World Fantasy Awards. The sequel, The Witness for the Dead, publishes in June 2021, and I cannot tell you how excited that is making me. Um, 
I didn't actually realize that the publication date was so soon until I was researching for this very intro. And when I read that, I kind of lost my mind. So congratulations on that as well. So excited to read the book. If you haven't read The Goblin Emperor, please do so. Moderator Alex Brown is a queer Black librarian, local historian, writer, and author. They write about speculative fiction and young adult literature for Tor.com and Locus Magazine, as well as on their blog, bookjockeyalex.com. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and access set the foundation of all their work. So the thing about being a reader of any genre is that you become versed in the mythology of not just a series or a writer, but in the mythology and framing of the genre that you're reading itself. So when we read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, we know what signifies, we know the course of the journey and the scope of the threat. We can see when something succeeds in retreading a well-known road in a fresh and vital way. And we recognize when an author looks straight at the known road and takes off into the sky instead. As readers of speculative fiction, we get to watch generations of writers build new edifices on old rock or pull new islands out of an old sea. And so even though we have here three authors whose books are incredibly different in terms of subgenre, in terms of voice and structure and setting down to their finest details, what we also have are three authors whose books speak to each other as different dialects of a common language. I'm so happy to have Alex here in their role of reader, critic, and librarian to tease apart the differences between, say, an early modernist goblin novel and a future tech dystopia, a future tech dystopia and Edwardian witchery, but also to bind together some of the threads that make speculative fiction such a distinct and beloved category of writing. It's a pleasure to have all of them with us tonight. So please, in the chat, welcome C.L. Polk, Malka Older, Catherine Addison, and Alex Brown. Thank you so much. Okay, let's just jump right into revolutions, rebellions, and resistance. Um, so my first question, uh, I'm actually gonna, this is sort of my lazy way of having you guys, uh, you all promote your own books instead of me just reading summaries. So um, why don't each of you tell us about your books and the revolutions within? I can pick people or you can just like do your, you know, dominate yourselves and go forth, whatever you want to do. I normally work with students and I have to, you know, poke them, so. Malka, do you want to go? <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, my books are set about 60 years in the future and take place in a world where the nation state is largely defunct. And there's a whole new um, way of organizing the global international world. Um, and it's based around what's called micro-democracy. So like democracy has gotten a lot more granular. Uh, and also there's this ginormous UN slash uh, Google sort of information management bureaucracy um, that is there to try to make sure that everybody has all the information they need to make good choices about democracy and also consumption. And that works out just about as well as you might imagine. Um, and so most of the books is really about um, a, a group of, of core characters uh, all of whom really want to make the world better and who disagree on both what it means for the world to be better and how to get there. And so there's a lot of fighting within the system. There's a lot of fighting against the system. Um, and there's a lot of trying to figure out how people can organize themselves um, in ways that are more accountable and participative and transparent even when people don't always want to do that, or even when um, there's lots of interests pushing in other directions. Um, so that's that's sort of the the like macro thirty thousand foot view of it. Um, but you know, I think a lot of the the stuff in my books that uh, is radical and revolutionary also has to do with the smaller details. It has to do with who is being centered and where, and it has to do with um, the sorts of questions that are being asked and the premises that are being questioned throughout the books. Thank you. Yeah, see, that's way better than anything I could have. <laughs> <laughs> so. Catherine, why don't you go? Sure. Um, so the Goblin Emperor is not about a revolution, but it's specifically about how not to have one. Because hmm. what I did was I, I looked at, at the French Revolution and said, well, we got to a good place, but could we skip the horror and the guillotine and all of the terrible, terrible things that happened on the way there? Um, so we start with the kind of Louis XIV 
court and then an airship explosion, which completely, completely upends the line of succession. And so the book is basically about the, the new emperor trying his best to make good decisions when he has no practice at making decisions on this level at all. Great. Delphi? Um, okay, so the Kingston cycle, um, taken as a whole, is a, it's a story about, um, okay, how do I start this? Basically, the story is about a modern society, um, decidedly so, um, that is a constitutional damn monarchy with a powerful parliament um, that basically um, runs its economy on capitalism. And uh, on the surface, it looks okay. It kind of looks like Canada. Um, but when you dig down, you end up basically like turning the rock over and discovering that there are horrible things happening underneath it. And what I wanted to do with the trilogy was to um, basically say, look, when you discover that your country is responsible for a terrible atrocity um, and has benefited, reaped the benefits and the profits and the prosperity of that atrocity, what do you do? Like, uh, what does your conscience tell you you need to do? Um, how do you how do you reconcile that with the comfort and and luxury that you are accustomed to that you suddenly can't ethically consume because of what? was basically underneath that making it possible to have happen and so i used the three novels to um one to show um the details of the situation as it is and then rip the lid off um and then i basically take the second book to show one person reacting um in what i would consider to be a well-meaning but awfully typical way um, and that through the course of the novel, as she tries to do the things that she understands and values and believes in, comes to realize that she cannot fix this problem with the tools that she has and that she's got to do something else. And then the third book basically goes to another person who has been resisting the system all along and has had the time to organize community and ha is the kind of person who um, basically wants to look at the whole of the situation and then try to see what's underneath to find the, the details, the perfect spot to kind of push the structure so that you can move it. Um, and that I, I kind of progress through these because it just it seemed like the logical thing to do. Um, and in the end, it ends with the state basically being overturned to, to like try an entirely new system. Thank you. Yeah, we've got sort of information cyberpunky revolution. We've got like destroy capitalism revolution. And then actually I would, you know, almost argue that it's sort of a quiet revolution in the Goblin Emperor, you know, that sort of cultural mm -hmm. revolution in a way. So it's, it's, interesting little shades of, of resistance all the way through. Um, okay, so we um, talking about sort of research and Catherine, you just touched on this about your research in the French court and the French Revolution. Um, how much research did you each do in crafting your worlds uh, in particular in deciding how the re revolutions would manifest and sort of the long-term consequences? So Malka, in particular, your series is like jumps forward in time a lot. Um, Telsey, yours is like sort of a couple of months, I think, maybe a year the span, but a lot, a lot of shit happened in, that in a Don't very know, short time. time. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then Catherine, I mean, yours also takes place within a short amount of time, but it's drawing on like centuries of tradition that kind of, you know, all come to a crashing halt basically with Maya. Um, so could you talk a little bit about your research and the sort of the real world stuff that kind of filtered in and how much of that real world stuff kind of affected the way that you wrote your books? 
Oh, start with Catherine this time. Okay. Um, so I should say also that The Goblin Emperor is a very utopianist book mm. because it is arguing that change is possible without, without, te- without the terror, basically. That you can actually have good come from individual people making small decisions differently. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I think that's really true. Um, I'd like to think it's really true. So I mostly, I, I mostly made everything up out of my head. <laughs> um, obviously, I, I based the court on Versailles and a little bit on the Forbidden City and, you know, on all of these very centralized, very elaborate courts. Um, and I was thinking about, about civilizations that lasted for centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, but I would be lying if I said I did a lot of intense research and mostly just made it all up. Fair enough. <laughs> Chelsea or Malka? Yeah, same. I did, I, I really didn't do any research. I did, except for things like I had to Google things like how many people lived in particular cities and then try to protect, project that into the future because population is a big thing and stuff like the, dist- the time it would take to travel from one place to another. But you know, I was really writing out of a place of, um, I mean, I was, I was in a way, you know, the research was what I had lived until then. You know, I was writing about places that I knew and the, the whole book, you know, the story and the idea was all coming from stuff I was already really annoyed about. And so that was, you know, besides being a nice sort of driving force, um, the, you know, the, the ideas for the revolution and these things, they were coming from me being angry about the way the world is today. And so I didn't have to do a lot of research for that because it's all right there for us to be angry about. Um, I was also, I, there's a, there's a fair amount of disagreement over whether my book is um, utopian or dystopian um, or neither. Uh, I, I think it's neither, but I think it l- does lend, t- uh, it, it tends a little bit, it leans towards the, the optimistic side. Um, although I, it's a really interesting contrast actually uh, with The Goblin Emperor because my book is very much about how organizations um, can potentially make things better little by little, even as they are also tripping over their own feet and sort of, and, and I think the process of kind of creative destruction in terms of those incremental innovations and, and sort of organizational shifts, um, but also imagining how that can be done without like enormous terror and catastrophe. So also kind of optimistic. Um, yeah, but we, you know, we try. <laughs> Chelsea. Okay, so um, when I research a book, I basically grab a bag and I put shiny things in it. <laughs> and there may not be a lot of connection, like on an obvious level between the shiny things. It's just like, I like this, in it goes. <laughs> um, and then I kind of, after I've collected a whole bunch of these things, I like lay them out and I, I just kind of play with them and I look for connections. Um, between things that may not be related to each other. So um, the research in the Kingston cycle is is basically this hodgepodge magpie, like disorganized bookmark list of whatever I happen to be curious about that day. And it all just kind of like percolated in my head. And then I was like, I want to write about, um, I want to write about state power. I want to write about basically like the way you can train individuals to see themselves as in service to the state in a bunch of different ways um like grace and miles for example were raised to believe that they were born to serve the state and that what they were doing was noble and ideal and vital and right 
the fact that they were filthy rich, mm, you know, whatever, uh, it's just it's just a side effect of the loyal, continuous service that their family has done to the kingdom that, you know, they happen to be rich. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, Grace didn't think about it too much. She swallowed the whole thing. She was the favorite child. She had no reason to question what she was taught kind of idea. And then I, you know, was looking at kind of like the family dynamics where you favor one child heavily and the other child gets all the blame that was in there um i decided that i wanted to make it so that city planning made transportation accessible by basically making the bicycle the main piece of transportation and um prioritizing bicycle traffic and pedestrian traffic um like i just grabbed all of this stuff and i was like I'm just going to throw it all in here and see what I get. <laughs> um, and so I, um, I guess I wind up with a lot of like groovy little details um, that come from the places where I research. But did I specifically research a, um, any revolution? No. No, I didn't do that. I did research um, American community organizing and civil rights movement because I wanted um, I wanted to think about how um, community organizers would get together in order to change things and how they would um, how they would run their neighborhoods and how they would organize and how they would communicate with each other and um, and that I wanted to like basically try and figure out the values of um, like the values that Robin grew up with, with her family, her clan and her community, um, what she was raised to believe as opposed to what Miles and Grace were raised to believe and to what Avia Jessup was raised to believe. Um, so I, I grab a little bit of inspiration from a lot of different sources Very cool. Very cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, each of your books, I mean, this this is true for a lot of books, but in particular, your three books or your three series, <laughs> um, each sort of play with tropes while folding in critiques of sociopolitical issues. And I know you've all sort of touched on this a little bit. Um, but Luke, Malka, your book is cyberpunk, but it's got romance and this whole like really intense political thriller thing going on. Catherine, yours is dealing with the physical and emotional side effects uh, or scars, excuse me, of abuse. Um, Chelsea, yours is, you know, fantasy, but it's playing really hard in the historical fantasy romance sandbox. <laughs> um, tell me about these, uh, these elements or these other elements um, and how they influence or excuse me, how these elements influence how your characters interact with the political machine. Kelsey, do you want to go first this time? Okay, so I have to say, like, right from the beginning, I'm going to answer the question that no one asked. Um, at the beginning of the book, I absolutely challenged myself to use the only one bed trope, even though I knew that they were going to be sleeping in an enormous house with 18 bedrooms. I had to figure out how to pull that off. <laughs> um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, it's like tropes are just another shiny thing um, mm. that goes with like all the other shiny things. So um how dare you ring? How dare you? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. She calls anyone anymore even. Um, one of the things that I do with tropes is like, I, I like to grab a trope that amuses me, a dramatic situation that basically like hooks me, gets me to like eyes on the screen or on the page or whatever because this particular dramatic situation is familiar to me I get a lot of enjoyment out of it um, and I want to see how this particular writer like uses this it's almost like for me tropes is kind of like the blues um, and that you have this thing where like the blues is a musical form but every single blues tradition um, 
is like geographically distinct and every single person who came up in that blues tradition has their own spin and that's what i love is the kind of the when you get down to the individual use of a universal thing love that Catherine Malka. Catherine, why don't you go sure um so i will admit that i was thinking really hard about the trope of the lost king mm. or the, the, the scullery boy who turns out to be the king, which mm. was a big thing in fantasy in the 80s when I was inhaling it um, by the pound. And thinking about, well, what would that really be like to be king after you were the scullery boy? Because that's not mm -hmm. something that those that that trope actually is very interested in is what happens the day after the coronation. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in what happened the day after the coronation. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't use the trope exactly because it was well, it's inherently deeply implausible, but that's okay. Um, but I was definitely thinking about that a lot and about what it would be like to be king without the training to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like when I was trying to start writing my, my books, cyberpunk, it, it, it did feel like something like a kind of reference um, that I could use to just like prize open the world and start start getting myself into it. And it was it was almost weirdly coincidental because I happened to be working in Japan at the time that I that the, all the thoughts about the book were getting to the point that I wanted to start writing them. And I happened to see this um, pachinko parlor that was called the 21st century and looked really ratty. And I don't know, that put me into the future. And somehow like, you know, thinking about Japan and the future and I had read plenty of cyberpunk as well as other stuff. And I just kind of, thought, yeah, you know, I would like to have assassins in this book. Um, <laughs> and, and it sort of, you know, it, it really, I don't know, it gave me a way to, um, to start putting a couple of attributes into the world and the characters that then made it easier for me to explore them and really figure out who they really were and what this world was really like. So I felt like it, it started pretty cyberpunk and then maybe kind of moved away from that as I learned more about the world and um, looked at other things because, you know, once I understood the place that I was dealing with and the system that I was writing about, what was so much fun and so fascinating to me was to take that out and look at the permutations of that across, for one thing, different countries. Um, and, you know, imagining how different countries would, would use this very decentralized, very diverse system and, and play out differently into different kinds of government. Um, but also like all the different parts of our lives, like all the different things, whether it's fashion or raising a family or education or, you know, career um, or romance. So I, 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 that was just really really fun. And, and I actually want to pick up um, on something that Chelsea said, which is that thing about what the things that you find enjoyable. And I've been really thinking about that a lot um, for a while in terms of what I find enjoyable when I read and how it's not really necessarily connected to the, the direness of the content, right? Like you can write about very disturbing stuff, but it can still be pleasurable to read not not because of the disturbing stuff, but because of the way it's written and because of the sorts of things that are that the characters are doing and the kinds of voices that they have. And so, and I've just, for one thing, I've been letting myself read stuff that's enjoyable for me. Um, and I've also been thinking about that in my writing, like just letting myself write stuff that's enjoyable, the shiny things and, and the things that I really would like to, to encounter on the page. And so, yeah, I just want to put in a plug for fun, and cozy and whatever other kinds of enjoyable we like. Nice, I like that. I'm I'm very interested in what a cozy cyberpunk story for me would, <laughs> would feel like. So get on that. Okay. <laughs> That's your new to-do list. Um, this is sort of a non-question. It's more like a, I was going to say, it's a discussion topic. Um, so all of your books deal with sort of 
fake news uh, and the manipulation of supposedly objective and neutral information sources in it sort of happens in very different ways and I'm not going to get into super detail about it but can you talk a little bit about sort of the control of information in your stories and what that means for an oppressed society and resistance? <laughs> Malka, do you want to go first? <laughs> what it says on the tin. Um, <laughs> infomocracy is the rule by information. And, you know, I was reacting to what I was seeing uh, in a lot of places and just really wanted to... Um, I mean, that's, I mean that's, that's what the books are about. They're just basically like, you know, we have all these people who have the trappings of power and blah, blah, and it's very nice. And yes, that gives them something. But in our world today, it's the people who have control over information who really are controlling things. And, um, and we need to be more aware of that. We need to be aware of the ways that it's hidden. And we need to be thinking about information as a public good and as something that we need to uh, be very conscious and intentional about because I think I really 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 think that we are at a point right now where we are beyond saying oh that's just the natural way to talk about it this is the neutral way to present it this is objective we know that that is not possible and that anytime someone says that they are it is not true they may be lying to themselves or they may be lying to you but we need to find other ways of validating and valuing the kinds of information we have. And this is, you know, I think there are a lot of different uh, problematics and um, tensions that, we're, that we have to deal with uh, in the coming years, but that one is certainly one of the big ones that we need to, to figure out how to deal with. It's not a new problem at all. It's in new permutations right now, but it's, it's really important. Um, especially if we agree that we're all in on democracy, which I hope we are. Um, but that's, you know, it's a big, it's a big issue in democracy. And that's, it's something that we have to deal with. And that can be dealt with, not perfectly ever, but it can be dealt with better than we're dealing with it now. Sorry, long answer. It's, there's a trilogy there. You can read it to find out more. Kelsey? I... I use like news media very much in the whole the whole series. There are newspaper articles, there are headlines, and I I did that very deliberately because I wanted to show, um, I wanted to basically have the headlines there as a contrast to what the characters themselves were experiencing in the book. I wanted to illustrate exactly how the people who basically grab control of the narrative control what people believe is true mm -hmm. um so um there are a lot of tactics around this one of the most popular ones is he who speaks first speaks truest even if that's not actually true so if you pop up first with an incredible lie and you basically drape it in um a nice kind of shimmering ensemble of, um, I'm just going to say it, emotional manipulation. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, your version is the champion that all other versions have to defeat. You have captured the imagination and the empathy of your readers. You have home court advantage. Um, and so basically, what is the function of a daily newspaper that is issued in the morning? It is there to deliver you the truth with your breakfast and to basically set you up with what you are supposed to believe before you even walk out the door. Um, and I realize that this is a really cynical way to talk about journalism. I'm very sorry, but um, <laughs> this is this is my experience of what the news is like lately, not necessarily what it was like when I was young, but certainly the way it is now. So I let my annoyance kind of get all over this page. <laughs> so the Goblin Emperor takes place at the beginning of an industrial revolution, which is also the beginnings, obviously, of an information revolution. Um, Newspapers are starting to be a thing. There are newspaper men in The Witness for the Dead, um, but it's not, it's not um, 
an institution the way it, it is, the way it, it will almost certainly come to be. So information is still very much word of mouth and letters and whispers um, and controlling it. it. We're also at the beginning of, of, of um, an emperor at least consciously realizing that yes, he can spin the news if he wants to. Um, which, and, and I'm very interested in um, the way that the story that gets told is different from the story that really happened. Um, and that's, which is, which is something that I think um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, wow. I think that disinformation and disinformation um, are things that are relevant regardless of the era that you're writing in. It just looks a little different in when the, the printing press is still something that's like within, within living memory. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. I I realized after I sort of asked this and was hearing all of your answers back that this is a very librarian question. So <laughs> sorry about that. Sometimes I get a little like librarian on me and and cannot <laughs> back away from that. No the, need the trials to help be, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good um, question. This, Oh, thank you. This is sort of a, another sort of dis discussion-y kind of thing, looking into the distant future of your world. I mean, it doesn't even have to be very distant, like a hundred years. Um, are things better from where you left off? Are they worse? Are they the same? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Malka, do you want to go? <laughs> that little laugh was interesting. Um. I mean, if we take if we take the sort of optimism that I talked about in setting my book, um, we can I can hope things are better. Uh, I think you know that there's there's sort of a a feeling in the book, and sometimes it's explicit among some of the characters that uh, that, that you know that the system that they created um, this this micro democracy system is itself part, it, you know, it's a step. It's a step at getting better, getting towards a system that is even more accountable and participatory and granular and, and, um, and gets, you know, sort of further along where we're trying to go, wherever that might be. Uh, and there's sort of a sense in the book that we're heading in that direction and that maybe there's some ups and downs along the way. But it's a, you know, it's that's pretty optimistic. Um, and there's some things that I did consciously in the book, like consciously when I wrote the first book, like there's evidence of climate change, but it's, it's dialed back just because that's not the story I was telling. I wanted to tell a story that was related to the politics of today. And if I went too far in a certain catastrophic direction, I wouldn't be able to tell that story, right? So that's, you know, it's kind of how far you take the premise of the book, but the three books in the trilogy are set, um, each of them is two years apart. And so, you know, on the one hand, I try to give some sense of that time passing and things changing. There's a sort of sense in the book that things are, that things change a lot. Um, and, uh, and that these, you know, these systems need to change and refresh themselves and have some creative destruction periodically. So, it's hard to look a hundred years forward from that because I think a lot would have happened in the meantime, but hopefully better. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we're trying. Okay. Catherine? It really depends on who's emperor after Maya. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends. And I don't know. Um, I can certainly imagine a, a future in which things have gone horribly wrong, but I can also imagine a future in which the empire and its two millennia worth of tradition have, has managed to sort of adapt mm -hmm. to a new idea um, in a non-destructive way, which you know, obviously I'm, I'm fond of the world. I hope that's what happens, but it's really hard. It really, it still really depends at this point on who the next emperor is. 
because they haven't they haven't gotten much out of the um, absolute monarchy yet. Now I want to know who. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I want to know who. <laughs> All right, Chelsea, you're up. Hundred okay, years this... into the Kingston future. <laughs> okay, so this is an entire economy size can of worms that you've just opened here <laughs> uh, because okay I'm going to tell you a secret about the Kingston cycle and that I didn't have the whole structure of the trilogy going on in my brain I didn't really think of it as like a historical political fantasy when I first thought about it I was very definitely kind of thinking about it from the point of view of like a, a high fantasy um D and D loving deep lore kind of nerd, um, and so there are like little bits and pieces that I failed to excise from the text, um, but I don't know if there's enough of them in in order that would like basically allow a reader to piece together the fact that the entire world is sitting right on the edge of an existential threat. Um, and I don't know, I like, I'm probably never going to get to tell this story because it is very, it is very, very, like, super, like, high fantasy, quest wars, intrigue, romance, um, like, big sweeping themes like that, that don't really have a lot to do with the nation of Eiland. It's just that Eiland is the major clue that it's happening. And so, like, Will the planet even be there in a hundred years? Well, that depends on whether people, the right people, figure out what's going on. And that's an entirely other series of books. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're it's almost four fifteen. We're gonna do a lightning round here. I've I've got to give a shout out to Christina Orlando at Tor.com because I'm stealing this from them. They did a, a panel, <laughs> they did this and I love it and I'm keeping it now. Um, so lightning round. So I'm gonna ask each one of you a question. You have to answer and do not think about it. Just first thing that comes to the top of your head, okay? All right. Chelsea, worst movie you've ever seen. Hudson Hawk and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Malka, best worst writing advice you've ever been given? Best worst? Yes. Like, what is, like, the worst piece of advice that you just think is amazingly terrible? I just saw one um, that I retweeted, so you guys can go look. It was, like, four days ago, and it was, any writing advice that has the words always or never in it is 97% sure that you can just throw it to the rabid geese. <laughs> nice. I agree. Catherine, favorite comfort food? Oh, mm, chicken curry. Ooh, good choice. <laughs> Chelsea, if you could write any IP, what would it be? Supernatural. Ooh, yes, second. <laughs> I will fight you for that. <laughs> Dean is my baby and he's mine. Um, <laughs> Malka, favorite fact? Fact? Yes. Facts don't exist. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Uh, Catherine, silliest thing that sparks joy for you? Um, I'm such a nerd. <laughs> I, I, I number the pages of my journal, and it gives me great pleasure to be able to use page 19 and page 19V for verso, because recto and verso. I, I am that kind of nerd. Nice. Yes, I am. I love it. I love it. It's great. Okay. We're doing the which one got to go round. Chelsea, which one got to go? Das Kapital by Marx, The Proposal by Swift, Animal Farm by Orwell, or B for, B for Vendetta by Alan Moore? Oh, my God. <laughs> Animal Farm. <laughs> <laughs> no explanation. Just Animal Farm. I love it. Uh, Malka, uh, which one got to go? Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, or Mark Zuckerberg? Okay, that is a mantle, and they all have to go. Uh, but if I have to choose Musk, get rid of Musk. There is a right question, or there is a right answer on this one, and it is all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Catherine, which one got to go? Martin Luther, Robespierre, Oliver Cromwell, or George Washington? Wow. Um, Robespierre. Right. And this is for all of you. Give me an elevator pitch for your favorite book. Chelsea. Uh, a bored teenager in a society, a dome society of luxury ruled by robots is bored with her life and wants meaning. All right, Malka. Uh, MM Country House Mystery, very hot. <laughs> and Catherine. A band of rabbits saves the world. Lovely, that's nice. All right, it's time Ooh. for audience Q&A. The first Q&A <laughs> is actually all about our, like, our cozy reads. So hopefully those favorite books we mentioned, because they're all asking what the books were. <laughs> that might be taking care of that question. Yeah, we absolutely have to know what the books are. You can't give those <laughs> the chance to not, not tell us. They're not going to tell us, are they? Oh, no, Maka, I can't um, hear you. I was, I, I was just whispering, um, but uh, I, are you going to read the question or should we just like... Oh, no, I'm going to read the questions. That's what I'm here for. But everybody does totally want to know what your favorite books are that you were, that you were mentioning. Okay. I was, I was doing um, Think of England by KJ Charles, which is, I think, I don't know. I think I undersold it because to me, like the pacing and the character work and the plotting of that book are just amazingly put together and every time I read it I'm like wow how how the plot how so go read it it's also really hot and and like all the things and like <laughs> thrilling and exciting and stuff um but just like the craft and very cozy KJ Charles is a public good oh my god <laughs> Um, yeah. The book that I was talking about is, to the great surprise of everyone who knows me, um, a book by Tanith Lee called Biting the Sun. It was written in like 1976. Um, I read it as a teenager and it has basically like sunk into my bones <laughs> and I don't even know why. Mine is Watership Down. Yeah, that's an easy one. <laughs> Too easy. There should be more books about rabbits save the world. Um, let's see. So as you noted, um, the first question that we have is from Rebecca, who says, Malka, what are some of the enjoyable, fun, cozy reads you've been enjoying? And there's more to the question for the other two of you. So I'll start with Malka. So yeah, KJ Charles that I just mentioned, all of them. And I will say to the, like, because we're discussing this whole coziness, um, she recently did a thread on Twitter where she was talking about how, like, there's, you know, in, in romance discord, there's happy, happily ever after, and there's happy for now. And she said, we actually need a new one, which is happy and fuck you. Because a lot of her books are not just about the people being happy. They're also about the people who need to get got getting got. And that's um, that can be really important in a cozy read. <laughs> anyway, they're very good. Go read them. The other books uh, that I have on my sort of like cozy, absolutely anytime when I really need it, comfortless are the entire Murderbot series, starting with All Systems Red on the unlikely event that anyone here doesn't know, <laughs> and um, and also T Kingfisher's recent um, the sort of Clockwork Boys Paladin Sword. Uh, cycle thing um, and and all of those books and this is this is kind of why I was talking about it they all deal with really difficult stuff uh, Murderbot deals with very serious stuff and issues and T. Kingfisher cannot write a cozy romance without having some kind of severed heads or something going on <laughs> and yet these are incredibly comforting books to read and I love them um, and I've also been reading some, oh, and also Sherry Thomas's Lady Sherlock series, which she just put up the pre-order for the, the, the next one, um, which again, like there's stuff that happens and they're just so great. Uh, and I've been reading some other mysteries and, I, and I've actually been really asking myself, like, 
how I determine this because these are not cozy mysteries in the way that that subgenre is used, you know, uh, traditionally. But for me, they're really cozy. And I wish I knew exactly what my criteria were so I could find books like this more easily because I don't know how to tell people exactly what makes them cozy for me. And I don't know if they'd be cozy for everyone else. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the beauties of it, I guess, it being lots of different books and lots of different people. Yeah, it's true that there's a vibe. You can write a very, a very difficult book that has like a, a sort of like kindness in its center. And mm -hmm. it designates who should be getting that kindness. And that's where it puts it. And then you're like, oh, no, this is great. Many bad things happen, but we're good right here. Um, so the end of that question from Rebecca was to Catherine and Chelsea. What are you reading? And does that feel joyful to you? Currently, the book that I'm reading is a reread. I'm rereading Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. Um, <laughs> this is kind of this is kind of this book that I, I keep kind of going back to because it it really it's kind of like my world builder secret weapon. <laughs> um, just like every time I go back to it some other aspect of the book is like a little bit more prominent for me. And that basically lets me know what I'm pissed off about that day. Um, for like actual fiction, the last book that I finished uh, is a slim little volume called The Memory Theater by Karen Tidbeck. Um, I really love this book. Um, when I first started reading the book, um, one of the things that I was thinking was that, you know, um, it starts out, very dark, very dark. Like it's, um, I had a little bit of trouble with it, but I, you know, I kept going. And what I discovered is that it was, while it was gruesome and cruel, it was also, um, how do I put this? It had its own kind of magical logic, its own fairy tale logic, um, that I found extremely appealing. And, um, I love the way the book turned in circles, but not like the same path all the time. What I mean is I love the way the book turned in spirals and came back to um, elements or situations or even scenes that had happened previously in the book, but were basically being repeated on a different level. I, I really liked it. I liked that book a lot. Catherine, how about you? I am rereading for the nth time um, The Complete History of Jack the Ripper by Paul Sugden. Um, I cannot explain to you why. Well, I can explain I can explain that Paul Sugden is one of the best of the ripperologists out there in like actually doing history. Um, why I keep coming back to Jack the Ripper, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe joyful, but like in a very specific. In a very, <laughs> very specific <laughs> way, yes. All right. Um, let's see. So we have um, one from Amanda that came in sort of halfway through the, the discussion, um, which was about emotional manipulation and information. So it's, uh, so do you think that your books about revolution play a part in being positive emotional manipulation, manipulation through information? Well, I mean, that's what fiction is, mm -hmm. is emotional manipulation. I mean, we, we, it's, it's consensual. You pick up a book knowing it's going to happen and you're, you're there for it. Although I have read books where I've came out the other end going, mm, no, I didn't sign up for that at all. Um, but that's what, that, I mean, that's what you're doing is you're emotionally manipulating the audience. And I hope that this is, I, I, I hope that I am, I do this in an ethical manner. That is my hope. Yeah, I and mean, we know that we're gonna be doing it. I. Uh, you know, we have to accept that our views and 
ideas and what we, you know, what we see in the world, what we want to see in the world are going to be coming through in what we write. And so got to try to do it in a positive way. And also, as Catherine said, in, in an ethical way, um, I think of it, uh, what I do somewhat as evidence-based creativity. So yes, I am advocating in my book for people to work together to make the world a better place uh, in various different ways and hopefully also questioning those ways at the same time. But, you know, it's based on stuff that has happened in history or stuff that I have seen or experienced personally. Um, and I think, you know, as I said, we're going to be manipulating our readers to some extent. We're going to be pushing our own agendas to some extent. Nobody is agendaless. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of different elements to doing it ethically. I think one part is not relying on stuff that we've been told or seen in movies or is commonly accepted wisdom, but digging deeper than that. And then the other part is, you know, trying to put something good in the world. And that doesn't mean always writing stuff with happy endings or writing positive things, because sometimes a warning that's really dire is the best thing you can put there. Um, and, and as I said before, lots of different books, lots of different people reading them. Uh, people work different ways. Some people need to see the hope. Some people need to see the warning. Um, and that's what's cathartic and makes sense. So anyway, um, yes. Um, a very long time ago, my friend Elizabeth Bear recommended that I read a book. Um, by John Gardner called On Becoming a Novelist. And some of, this is another book that I keep coming back to to reread. Um, one of the things that I read, and at the time I was kind of angry at, was this. Once one has recognized that the novelist ought to be able to play advocate for all kinds of human beings, see through their eyes, feel with their nerves, accept their stupidest settled opinions as self-evident facts for them, one simply begins to do it. And doing it again and again, carefully rereading, reconsidering, revising, one gets good at it. And I was sort of like, I, but I don't want to be in the head of a nasty, horrible person, mm -hmm. except that I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is the thing that readers really like. Like, I mean, we all enjoy TV, we all en enjoy movies and kind of things, but when you're a reader, what you want to do is you want to stare at the page and you want to basically like have this glorious kind of visionary experience in your head, but you also want to feel other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I think that that's, you know, that's why I like to read books for entertainment and, um, and that there's an opportunity there to, for a reader to basically see someone who is not like them and have a chance to kind of share their experience and understand their perspective. Um, and so am I emotionally manipulating you? Hell yes, I am. That's the point. That's what you paid $15 for. <laughs> all right. Um, Catherine asks, this could be a question to all of the authors. What are you surprised that your readers have taken away from your books? Um, I, I mentioned this before, but there's I'm, every time I see my book on a top 10 dystopias list, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> I don't think my book is particularly dystopian, um, but I can understand where people are coming from, I guess, uh, when they think it is. Uh, so that's that's been a really interesting. Um, also, also the libertarians love it, which is probably less surprising but I hadn't it hadn't quite occurred to me uh and and I even like sort of send up the the, the libertarian mindset in one of the governments that I talk about so I don't know I guess they thought it sounded good anyway um but but mostly the dystopia thing is um it's really interesting to me what people think what people consider I guess like usually my reaction to that is if I think this book is hopeful and everyone else thinks it's dystopian 
I am much more cynical than I thought I was. So I guess it, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a little bit about like relative position compared to where we live now, maybe. Well, and I use that word, which is not not the right word to use. And I wonder if it is partly an issue of of cynicism versus hopefulness and your respective places on that spectrum, and partly also just like a an issue of genre language, where a lot of people who are using the term aren't necessarily thinking about the nuance of super subgenres and kind of see anything technological and anything futuristic with any kind of problems attached to it as inherently dystopian because that's what it was 10 or 15 years ago. That's that's a really interesting point. And I think it goes to some of the ideas around tech solving all of our problems as soon as we figure it out. I also kind of feel like there's a, um, a connection to 1984 that makes people think surveillance is automatically dystopian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have a lot of thoughts about that related to the book. Um, but, you know, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to necessarily say that, I mean, I think if people take the book that way and it's meaningful for them, that's fine. Like, I don't want to say that it's not a uh, dystopia, but I find it really interesting because that's not how I saw it at all. And Didi, Didi agrees with me. <laughs> I see that. Um, Chelsea, how about you? Um, I'm trying to think of like, what am I surprised that my readers have taken away from my books? Um, I can't really think of anything. I think, um, I think that, you know, some people, some people will read my books and what they're interested in is this thing over here. Um, and then somebody else will read my book and what they're interested in is this thing over there. But their enjoyment of the books, if you were to like measure it in piles, are pretty much equal, even though they are like focusing on very different things. Um, I didn't really expect that to happen. Um, I am always surprised when people talk about the Kingston cycle as this comforting, fluffy, cozy, romantic, sweet. I'm like, did you notice the slavery? Did that? Did 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 you see that? Did <laughs> so I I like am a little bit bemused by that I'm not sure um exactly how I guess it's just that when you have a romance it kind of it takes up a lot of space on the stage maybe maybe that's what's going on that's so interesting because that's another genre thing isn't it where like people focus in it's very difficult I think for people to think about things in terms of like genre as being something that can overlap to create something new and it's more like when you're reading part of I think you know mine included part of a lot of people's mindset when reading is like at least partially always thinking about how they can categorize what they're reading so if that's what they're pulling out of your book first like that's what people are focusing on after they've finished um, which I think is really interesting um, especially given all of the other things that are going on in those stories um, Catherine, how about you? Any surprised reactions? Um, I have been surprised at how at how positively people have reacted to to the Goblin Emperor specifically, um, because I, I I was writing it and thinking, oh, this is terrible. Nothing happens. Nothing happens in this entire book. Um, <laughs> And it's so good, though. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, you know, readers disagree with me, which is great. Um, but people have told me that it has been a great comfort to them. And I am very, very pleased by this, but also um, surprised because I did not expect that. I, I know many, many people who have read that book, and I think all of them um, more or less to think of it in those, those terms. Um, I think it is probably very helpful if you are somebody whose experiences are not comfortable to read a book where the experiences of the character are not comfortable, but you are allowed to be loved, fulfilled and happy and comfortable at some point. Um, mm. And I think in some ways that's actually easier for a lot of people to, to take to their hearts and really cling to than something where everything is fine all the time. So I guess you actually found the perfect formula <laughs> for making people feel cozy. 
I, w- I want to jump in real quick. I actually put off the Goblin Emperor for a long time because I thought it was like going to be super dense high fantasy and elves and goblins. And I was just like, Lord of the Rings bored the pants off me. Like, I didn't want to do it. And then I got it for for this panel. And then I was like, I read it. I was like, oh my God, this is a whole book where like nothing happens. Like, it's nice people doing nice things and they eat nice food. And everybody just says nice. And it was so great. Like, I love it. So There's actually, perfect. there's like, three assassinations in the book i mean i know but they're yeah, just not like, actually oh, nothing, nothing but nice happened. people doing nice things <laughs> although i will say also i'm a total like process and 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 government geek so it might have felt like there was a lot happening to me <laughs> I, it, for me the goblin emperor is kind of like 425 pages of city council meeting and i'm yeah. so here for this like yeah. i am it's like two I, dedications like, oh. to court paul <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's no big battle scenes. There's no, like, you know, like, we aren't on the ship when it blows up. Like, it's just, like, Maya's just nice. And, and he just says he's nice. <laughs> and <laughs> bad people go away. <laughs> and he just gets to be nice. In his very nice white clothing. And I just, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I kind of like Maya because it's talking to the trope. And, and I'm going to point at Wheel of Time here. Love you, baby, but let's talk about this. Where Rand Althor, farm boy, finally <laughs> discovers that he is the king of Tyr. And Tyr is this, like, incredibly, like, intense political, um, political entity where, you know, basically, like, everybody has a ladder on their back. Everybody has a knife in their hand. And... Rand just kind of rolls in, says, this is what we should do, because I think it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and, like, he does not care about playing the game at all. Um, and it works. And basically the idea is that we are supposed to accept that Rand Thor is a good king because of his heroic moral value. And that everybody instantly recognizes it. And the Goblin Emperor is like, yeah, you know what? Let's look at that. <laughs> Wheel of Time may or may not have been one of the books I was thinking about when I started writing The Goblin Emperor. Oh, goodness. Um, so we, we have run over a little bit. So I just wanted to, to share. Um, Evelyn in the chat says that, um, it says, I think what some of what made the Kingston cycle feel comforting to me was knowing and trusting that the awful was going to be challenged and deconstructed. Um, not wanting me to think it was okay to let me... Um, sit with my anger with the bad stuff and like went, yes, you are allowed to be angry with this shit. Um, and I think that actually speaks to what all of you have been talking about in terms of not only what your books do, but what you, you want your books to do and even what your readers are getting out of them. Um, so I think that's actually kind of a, a great place to wrap up the Q and A um, just to say, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to see um, three very different writers approaching speculative fiction in a way um, that's very thoughtful and very intelligent, doing really remarkable world building. And the, the center of each of your books, there is this sort of um, kind and steady emotional core that is what draws people to them over and over again. Um, so thank you all for writing what you write. Um, do any of you have any last words that you'd like to say to close out the event? All right. Well, thank you to Alex for moderating this great conversation. Thank you to Catherine, Malka, and Chelsea for your wonderful answers and recommendations and insights. Um, and thank you to everybody in the audience who chose to be with us today. Um, I'll be sending you an email tomorrow or so. Just a reminder that you can get all of their books, including Alex's books, um, for 10% off on our website through the end of the week. Um, so I'll send you a reminder with all the links. I'm sure that there are a couple of things that you now super duper want to read that you haven't read already. Um, so thank you again and good night to everyone. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Oh, this is so great. I'm glad I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hey. Bye.